This morning, I uh, dealt with the problem of uh, publishing material and, and uh, how one uh, writes proposals and things of that nature to get your work published. And the point I made is that you always have to uh, focus your attention on the publisher, their needs, their uh, the kind of books they publish, and adapt your style to it. So uh, sometimes you don't want to apply to a publisher because their style of writing is not the kind that you like. In my particular case, I've been rather fortunate because I've got a number of publishers who sort of are used to my style of writing. And uh, so um, um, my books are a little bit different from most books in the sense they're very personal. I have a lot of jokes in them. I fool around in them. I have little cartoons in them, all that kind of stuff. But uh, at the beginning, I wrote in a much more formal way myself because I was just beginning and I didn't have a group of publishers that sort of were interested in my particular stuff. It's also a very chancy matter, like um, I, I did this book called Media Analysis Techniques, and, and that that is now in its fifth edition. I brought a copy here for you. And with the first edition of that, when I sent it off to the publisher, it was rejected. My idea was that uh, instead of teaching students uh, what this professor said about something or what that professor said about something, teach the students a methodology and, and teach them how to apply that methodology. That's what all my games and so forth are involved with. Um, then I told a friend of mine, I said, I, I have this idea for a book that I think is really great. Uh, he said, give it to me, I'll send it to someone. He sent it to the same publisher. They accepted it. <laughs> so the point is sometimes... Uh, things are rather freaky. You send, uh, you send something to them, they accept it, or they reject it. You send it back to them, they accept it, with no changes, basically. It all depends on which uh, editor it goes to and things of that nature. But it's a very interesting process because if you have ideas that you want to publish, you have to figure out uh, which publishers are most amenable to the kind of writing you do and, um, and which publishers sort of deal with the kind of students that you want to reach. So in, my, in the course of my career, I've been pretty lucky in the sense that um, I found a couple of publishers that uh, take a lot of my stuff. I found one publisher who rejects almost everything. <laughs> but if you don't take it too seriously, then you, know, you can survive. If you, if you take a rejection seriously, it's the end of you. Uh, this, I, had a very, I had a friend who was a very famous uh, political scientist at the University of California at Berkeley. He was the head of the American Political Science Association in America and so forth. And he had articles rejected. So he said to me, Arthur, he said, if you get a rejection, the first thing you do is you take it out of the envelope with the rejection, you put it into another envelope, send it off to another publisher. And that's the way it works, because everyone is rejected. So it's very unusual that somebody isn't rejected. It's not a matter of because you're rejected because the material isn't good. It's because the, uh, they have something similar, they've published something similar, they don't like your style, whatever it is. So you have to sort of uh, accept the notion that um, you're not going to bat 100% when you're sending articles off to publishers. Yeah. So then, uh, then we had certain questions about um, how, do you design your, um, you, you, how do you design your proposals and things of that nature. The point I made is that um, you have to sort of think, think of the, the uh, editor and the, what's going on in the mind of the editor. So it's a good idea when you're doing a uh, proposal to have a little brief description of the nature of the book, to list the various chapters, and to offer a chapter to uh, as an example of your style of writing so they can determine whether they like your style of writing or not, whether they think it's suitable for the kind of uh, book that you want to publish and so forth. So that's just generally the way I do things. I, I first, I, um, I make a little advertisement in which I... I often have a, um, uh, a list of the, of the contents of the book, a little bit about it, and, and tell the editor if he's interested in a proposal to get in touch with me through email or something like that. Sometimes I have an image on there, too, just to attract their attention. So the first I, is I send a, a, a query letter. If that query letter is, a, if, is successful, then I send the proposal. Then the proposal often has an outline of the uh, chapters and a, sample, a couple of sample chapters. And then uh, you send that to the editor and you hope for the best. You keep your fingers crossed and you hope for the best. It could be that you don't hear from them for months, and yet they're going to take your book. So you have to sort of develop a, a thick skin 
and learn how to um, learn how to deal with the fact that uh, many times your books are up in the air and you don't know what's going to what's going to what's going to happen. In the course of my career, I've uh, I've written a lot of books, and mostly they're about books that on subjects that interest me. I I don't like to write about a book that I don't think is interesting you know, to me. A number of years ago, a um, an editor said to me, uh, "If you'll write this introduction to communication, Arthur, I'll uh, I'll guarantee you can take your wife to Europe every summer." But he had the, the type of book in mind that I don't like to write—a great big thick encyclopedic book on communication. And I like to write different kinds of books, so I said to him, "Well, you need to get a different kind of writer. I'm a uh, I'm a writer who sort of writes little books on subjects that interest me, and hope that uh, some students will like them, that kind of thing. But there are some writers who uh, have the ability to write huge manuscript, you know, 1,500 pages or 2,000 pages of manuscript, which then becomes a very substantial book, 600 pages, something like that. I don't seem to have that in me. I I write fifty, sixty thousand words, and then my mind stops. <laughs> stops, stops working. Sometimes even thirty thousand words. Uh, so, uh, a lot depends on your particular background, your interest, uh, what people know about you, and that kind of thing. So, so this book, uh, this is my most recent book, Messages, and uh, it's kind of interesting. I um, I did the cover for this book. What happened was we were talking about covers, and I. They have an artist who often does the covers, but I thought, well, I think I'll make a little collage uh, to for the for this book. And so what I did is I I made this collage, and it it has all this stuff. And then I uh, I told the artist that I like a certain type typeface that I thought would be nice. It's, this isn't exactly what it is, but it's close enough. The only thing I didn't like about this book is they put my name under under here. I I would have liked to have it go over there and go in front of the thing. But you can't win them all when you're um, when you're uh, dealing with publishers. Basically, you do what they tell you, and so it took me actually ten minutes to make this little collage. Here, it's kind of interesting. If you turn it upside down, what you see it is my. Uh, it says go to the gym, uh, go go to uh, the store and buy things, bananas, <laughs> buy vegetables, you know, get some pasta, two pounds of cheese. Then I'm meeting a friend at six o'clock. So basically. This is a little part of my life in this uh, in this kind of book. This I took from some um, currency from uh, uh, I don't know Indonesia or some place that just have this currency lying around. I cut out the faces and then I pasted a few other things together, and I sent it to the the, the editor, not the main editor but his assistant, and he liked it. And he sent it to the main editor. The, the main editor liked it, so here it is, uh, my my book in this here is a little bit when I taught at Hong Kong Polytechnic University. This, I think, actually is my name in Chinese or something like that. I'm not exactly sure. And then the book is, um, the book, uh, I did this drawing uh, for, the, for the back cover. And, and the drawing talks about the different topics it deals with, interpersonal, uh, nonverbal language, myth, media, genres, things like that. Then the artist got the idea, kind of interesting, of uh, of taking this sort of notion of somebody on a pedestal, and in the pedestal I talk about the different things in the book, and using them to to open every every chapter. So um, she used my signature here. She used an old drawing of me. She's uh, she took a quote that I said in this book. I said I'm out to change the way you, you see the world one page at a time. And there's Karl Marx, and, and, and this is her idea, because the pig is saying this, and Karl Marx is saying capitalist pig. So this is the, uh, it's a very unusual beginning of a book, I can assure you. There are not very many books start like this. And then um, for, each, for each chapter, we have a collage of certain things, like this is Marshall McLuhan, this is James Bond, here's the character that I did originally. Here's a turtle saying, what would Freud say, Marx, so sure, and so forth. So this book is very visual. And I, I did it because I want the students to feel it's a friendly book, as opposed to a, a book that's intimidating or something like that, with the hopes that uh, because I have a lot of drawings and things like that in that. And here's the second, uh, here's chapter one, 
another drawing and so forth. Now this book is one of my favorite books. It's called Bloom's Morning. But this isn't the original cover I did. Uh, the original cover is on the hardback version, but uh, this is on the paperback version. This book was very difficult to publish because it's really on, it's on comf uh, coffee, comforters, and the secret meaning of everyday life. And what that meant is I had to figure out the secret meaning of all these things. You see, It was very difficult to write. So um, it, it, it takes its idea from, uh, uh, from Ulysses, James Joyce's novel, Ulysses, in which Bloom is about one day in the life of Bloom. So I, since I couldn't do the whole day, I called it Bloom's Morning. Let's see. But it really is on material culture. It's about cl digital clock radios, king-sized beds, sheets, closets, jogging, bath soap, shampoos, toothpaste, all the little trivial things that are part of a life. And my theory was, if you want to know about what life in America is like, you should know about all these little things that we do every morning, see, as opposed to what our great philosophers had to say and so forth. Because this gives you an insight into life in America as well as what the great philosophers had to say. So here's my article in gel toothpaste. The difficulty in writing this book was that at the end of every chapter, I had to have a kind of punchline that sort of stood, stood, stood with you. And I, um, I had a lot of fun with this book. I have a book on pajamas, I have something pajamas, slippers, hair dryers, toothbrushes, razors, underwear, stockings. And I have one on toast. That's a, that, that was a lot of fun. Let's see. I have, here's the refrigerator. Let's see. Here's a drawing of supermarkets where I spend a lot of time, and most people do. I have one on toast, in which I pose a philosophical question, and that is, uh, what is toast? You see, uh, is when you put bread into a toaster, is it still bread or does it become something else? Now I was having a little fun with this. But um, everyone gets a kick out of this, and uh, when this publisher did a did a book, did a, did a book uh, of some of my writings and so forth, what did they put up there? Toast, because <laughs> because they were sort of intrigued with my discussion of what toast is. So each of the books has a certain different uh, has a different quality. The interesting thing about this book is. Um, a publisher was interested in this book. They made me write a new introduction. They made me do a new conclusion. Then they rejected the book. <laughs> so I found another book. I found another publisher. It took a, uh, took a long time. And in, uh, then in here is something rather interesting. Uh, this is uh, a drawing I did of what I call the onion of culture. And what I argued was that if you look at a society, you find it's like an onion. In the center is myth. Then you have history, you have high culture, you have popular culture in everyday life. Since I did this onion of culture, I've added another item, psychoanalytic theory. So basically, uh, and I did this drawing, in case you're interested, in 1974, when I wrote an article about myself called The Secret Agent. See? Of course, I was very scared coming here when I have an article called The Secret Agent, that the people in the, the, in, in the, the spy agency here are going to swoop down and throw me in jail. But um, I wrote this in 1974. 35 years later, I wrote a book on this. <laughs> so it just shows you how things work in the writer's mind. I had written this, I had done this drawing, and then uh, a couple of years ago, I said, you know, I ought to write something on myth. And I wrote this book. I wanted to call it Myth and Media. My publisher wanted to call it Media and Myth. Who do you think won? My publisher, <laughs> it didn't matter to me one way or the other. But what I did is I took a number of myths and I showed how these myths can be reflected in everyday life, how they sort of permeate in our culture. So the argument is that we do a lot of things that we don't think have a religious significance or anything like that, but they're really, they're really sort of myths that have been sort of stripped of, this, of their sacred and religious nature. Like a New Year's celebrations originally was a myth, mythic experience. Now. We, uh, we, have, we have a celebration and so forth and so on. But it's really connected to ancient myths that we had in the, in the, in the good old days. So that's, uh, that's what I've been doing in the last uh, 35 years, writing these crazy books. And um, not always getting them published. Most of the time I'm getting them published. So. Can I ask you a question? Yes? It was uh, 
semiotics as the key methodology for discovering whatever you are presenting in your books. Can you say some words yes. about semiotics? Yes. What it can? Yeah. Can you do <laughs> yes. Incidentally, I. I've, I, uh, I own the copyright to a book on semiotics, and I've given it to the university. So you can publish this book on semiotics. Um, in 1974, um, I had a, uh, I had a uh, sabbatical. I was in London doing research on pop culture, English pop culture. And a friend of me, mine sent me this book by Saussure called uh, Course in General Linguistics. At that point, my life changed. You see. As soon as I read *Course in, Lin in General Linguistics*, now in, I became more semiotically inclined. I've always used psychoanalytic theory and Marxist theory in my analyses, but then I then I added semiotic theory, and it's sort of all of these books. You see, what if you analyze gel toothpaste, you see, or electric toothbrushes? Basically, you are looking at it as a sign, and you know, trying to figure out what the signs are. Semiotics is the science of signs. A sign is anything that can be stand that can stand for anything else. So you look at anything, and you say it's a sign. But a sign of what? What's in that sign? And how do you figure out what to write about it? As far as that sign is concerned, recognizing that signs can often lead you astray too. Like uh, sometimes in in um, I have this book about uh, Thailand, and they have this page of beautiful women, but they happen to be men. <laughs> so. Uh, that beautiful woman you see happens to be a man, dressed up because they have a tradition of dressing of men dressing like women and so forth and so on. So uh, once you recognize that signs can lie, but that signs can have a tremendous amount of information to give you, then you can have a lot of fun. So uh, basically, I would describe myself as a semiotician who uses other techniques such as Marxism, psychoanalytic theory, sociological theory, whatever theory fits to make my analyses of whatever it is I'm interested in. And a number of my books, uh, by chance, you see, this book, this book is really a book on what we call material culture. Material culture is studied by anthropologists. They want to know what people in these ancient, these old, you know, these primitive tribes, what objects they have, how they use them, and so forth. Well, this is just the same thing. I just took this theory of, uh, uh, of being an anthropologist a cultural anthropologist, and instead of applying it to New Guinea, I applied it to California or, or, or to the United States. Okay. So that's where I am now. One last thing I might I might point out. Question. Yeah. Um, could we just turn back for like five minutes? Yes. Back? You were talking about inquiry letter. As soon as the inquiry letter, yes. inquiry letter, yes. uh, stands to be the first step to contact your publisher. Yes. What is the cornerstone of this letter? The cornerstone of the letter is to tell them, give them an idea what's in the book. So, so in, the, in, the, in the advertisement, basically I call them ads and ads. So the book like, would say messages, an introduction to communication. Then I would list the chapters. And then I say a little bit about this, the tone and so forth and so on. And I say if you, if you think a book like this might be suitable to your publishing list, please get in touch with me and I'll send you a proposal. Or I could even send you the whole book, because I am unusual in the sense that most people do not write a book until they have a proposal accepted. I write a book and then hope it'll be accepted. You see. And my theory is this. Why waste months and months while editors are trying to make up their mind whether to publish your book or not? Write the damn book and see if you can find a publisher. So I'm very unusual in that respect. Most everyone I know stops at the proposal level. Once they get the acceptance for the proposal and sign a contract, they write the book. I write the book, I send the letter, the letter out, then I send the proposal, or I send them the book, and then I get the contract, I hope. <laughs> and in the body of a proposal, uh, you were talking previously about the competition of your book, of your contract. Yes. Um, but still, a proposal, it's not an encyclopedia. You need to describe this comp competitive value of your book in a oh. very brief and straightforward language. Yes, language. yes. Well, obviously, you see, think, put yourself in the mind of an editor. Mm -hmm. He gets a letter from, from someone says, I, I have this book. And, and the person who sends that book always must keep, who sends that letter must keep in mind, what are the competition? Why, why publish my book rather than someone else's book? Why, you know, what do I have to offer that's different than these other books? So you have to talk about how this book differs 
from other books and what's in it uh, so that they'll know what it's going to be about. And generally speaking, the editors who are, uh, they call them acquiring editors, they don't necessarily know anything about the subject. They just know the, the, the methodology of doing it. After they've done it a few years, then they get, they get, some, you know, they get some knowledge. So you can be an acquiring editor. I, uh, six months ago, I got a, a message from this acquiring editor. She had just taken a job with this publisher who's, who published a book on advertising that I did. And she said, would you like to do a new edition of the book on advertising? Now, she does communication. She does anthropology. You know, sometimes they do three or four different things. So she knows enough from her past background to get an idea of what a communication book should be like and what an advertising book should be like and so forth. So since this is the fifth edition of the book, she didn't have to worry too much about what I'm going to do in the book. But it's not an unusual situation when uh, an, an acquiring editor wants to know what's in the book, how does it differ from other books, what's the competition like, uh, who might be interested in this book, you know, what... Uh, uh, who, who do you know that uh, teaches courses in this subject that might want to get the book and so forth? So it's a very complicated process in which uh, they're, they're always trying to figure out, is it worth publishing? Is it uh, a contribution to the field? Uh, will it get an audience? You know, if it doesn't get an audience, then uh, there's no sense in publishing the thing because they'll go out of business. You publish good books and nobody reads them, you're out of business. <laughs> so... Better a bad book that lots of people will read than a good book that nobody reads. <laughs> my question about the, uh, my question I asked you like a few yes. moments ago about the article publishing. Yes. About the uh, method you advised me that you take a journal, several copies of this journal and look through and practically to approximate. The, the style. style. Yes, look, if you, look, the editor of a journal like certain style. I mean, as a rule, they like a certain style. So you look and see what are the what have other people who have been successful in selling articles to that journal, what do they do? So you look at the style, you look at the way they write their things, and then you sort of approximate the style, not the content. I mean, because the content is, is all your own. But you want to adapt the style to what the, what, the public, what the publication usually uses. So for example, I tend to write in a rather breezy style very personal jokes, have fun, and so forth. That would not be good in certain journals that are very, very self-conscious and very serious about themselves and so forth. So I have to find journals that like my kind of stuff, you see. Uh, so uh, to tell you the truth, I've been so busy writing my books that I haven't written too many articles. But every once in a while I get a request for an article. So the, I get the request for the article because they read my books and they like my style of writing. So it all works out very nicely in the end. But um, you must always make sure that you look at copies of the journal that, you, that you're going to send an article to and make sure that you're, you're sort of in their parameters. That's important. So um, this is, I, I do all my writings on the journals, you see. Uh, and I've been keeping journals, you see, this is journal number 95. I've been keeping them a long time. So in here, I, I, I did the cover of uh, the journal, but I didn't, uh, and then I just put it in myself to type the, the thing itself, because I, I like to have a little drawing, a little image on the thing. And uh, in these journals, I write notes, I play around with ideas, I do little drawings, I make lists and charts and so forth. So I always, I always uh, start them off with a title. So this one I call Discourse, because I'm here in Minsk, the center of discourse analysis in the universe. <laughs> At least some people think so. So um, then I have a calendar, so I know exactly what's happening. So this is, this is freezing in Minsk, this pink here. This is getting sun in Mexico. <laughs> and later in, uh, in May, it's going to be in Iran, if, if all works out the way it's supposed to be. In any case, so I have a little calendar. So I'm going to keep track of what's going on. And then... Uh, the first page is always projects, like uh, this one says, get your eyes checked in 19, 2015, and so forth. This, and then I list different projects, and sometimes th this list of projects goes from, next, from one journal to the next journal to the next journal, and so forth. Then I list books that I'm working on and travel plans. See. Then the journal starts, and in the journal I always start off with the day and what the weather's like. So I don't have a problem here in Minsk, I always put gray. <laughs> Although we've had a couple of sunny days. And then I do writing. Like here, for example, I have a list 
of publishers to whom I'm going to send queries about this book, Gizmos. Here I have a list of publishers who might be interested in this book I'm working on called Applied Discourse Analysis. You know. So I write that down and I, I indicate whether they're interested or not by getting an X or so forth and so on. Then I did little, little drawings like it happens in, in San Francisco. The San Francisco uh, Giants won the World Series. So there was a lot of excitement about baseball and so I did a little drawing of a baseball. And so what I do is I keep notes as I go along, and uh, all my books come out of this. Then at the end, the last point, I have an index in which I talk, in which I list the different things I wrote about in the journal, so I can find what I. If I want to write about something and I want to find it, it's in that index. So that's basically how I work. Great, <laughs> and of course I think that uh, your journalism education <laughs> influenced upon your style of a writer and your being. Yes, it did. Uh, I pointed out uh, that I learned to write when, in, when I went to journalism school. Yeah. Not only did I learn to write, I learned to sit down and start writing right away. I took a course that actually did that. They would sit you down, give you something to say, start writing. Whereas I have friends who ponder and for days, weeks, months. If I want to write something, I sit down and I start writing. You know, three o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the afternoon, whatever the hell it is, if I sit down there, I can start writing. You know. But then I also have a lot of stuff in here that I can... You see, I do a lot of my thinking here so that when I sit down to write, I just don't make it up out of my mind. It's all in this journal and I can sort of play around with it. Well, if you want to be successful as a writer, the most important thing you have to realize about writing is it involves rewriting. No first drafts of anything. In fact, uh, with this book on messages, I did like five drafts. So you have to be willing to revise what you've written but you have to do a lot of spade work first. That's why I think it's a good idea to keep a journal. Keep notes to yourself. Uh, when you're writing in the journal, ideas that you ideas pop into your mind that you never would have thought of. You write them down in the journal, and they're not lost. If you're just sort of sitting there and an idea comes to you, it's fugitive, it disappears, you may never get it again. So um, my journals have been very, very important to me. And I actually started keeping this journal when I went to journalism school.